Thank you, Al. What a pleasure to be here. Congratulations to all of you for your great success you've had. And uh, it's, just, it's just an honor to be in front of winners. I was on United Flight 346 from Denver to Boston. And about, it's about a three and a half hour flight. About two hours into the flight, with no warning at all, the plane just dropped 1,000 feet. It was the most frightening experience of my life. We bounced around the air for about 20 minutes. And finally, things calmed down. And when things calmed down, a very confident pilot came over the intercom. And he said, ladies and gentlemen, we've hit some bumpy air. <laughs> We're like, no kidding, Sherlock, we know that. He said, but listen, here's what's, here's what's going on. There are two of us in the cockpit. Collectively, we've been flying for 50 years. We've been through bumpy air before. There's a storm approaching. We're going to go to a higher altitude, and the rest of the ride should be smooth. But just in case, stay buckled in. Drinks are on us. We're going to have some fun. We will get into your gate on time. So it was a great big sigh of relief. We pulled our fingernails out of the armrest. You know, people were starting to talk again. And uh, when I think back to that story, I think of what he did. He acted as a great financial advisor who helped us get through a rocky period. He knew exactly what to say because he probably had a script. He probably said this many times before. He just put us at ease. So I thought about this. Isn't that your role also? to provide three things like the pilot did, leadership, confidence, and direction. Every day, right? And part of that is scripting, knowing exactly what you want to say, how to say it, doing it with confidence. So when I thought about that, I thought, what else could have happened? What if instead a very nervous sounding pilot came over the intercom after we'd been bouncing around and dropping through the air, and he said, oh my god, did you feel that? I have been flying, flying planes for three years. I have never been through this before. Please buckle in. I'm going to try to find a highway and land this thing. Right? People would freak out. I mean, even when we, when we start bouncing through the air, there were about, I don't know, a dozen co college girls on that flight going to Boston, and they were screaming bloody murder. It was really frightening. So this pilot put us at ease. So today we're going to talk, talk about a number of things. First of all, we're going to talk about referrals, but a big part of that ties into scripting. So when I talk about scripting, I don't want to see your eyes roll because some scripting is pretty pitiful. I remember I was making dinner one time and the phone rang. This was before caller ID. So I pick up the phone and this was the script that was read. Hello, is this the woman or the man of the house? Horrible, horrible. That was a bad script. So, you know, I'm a good guy. Al raved about me, I really appreciate it. But I couldn't resist hitting this softball out of the park. So my response to her question, is this the woman or the man of the house, was, Actually, this is the family golden retriever. And I've been, I've been taught to take calls like this. How may I help you? And there was a pause, and then there was a click. And they never called back. All right, bad script. But when we talk about scripting, think about some of the best actors you've ever met. Think about some of the best movies you've ever watched, right? Everything they say, everything they do is scripted. But they've rehearsed it so many times that it just rolls off their tongue and it's very natural. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay, so we're going to have some fun today. I will open this up for Q&A. Outside, you have a copy of So What? Most of what I'm going to talk about today, whether it's referrals or scripting or using a personal biography page, is all in the book, or you can get a CD. All right? It's uh, right out by the front desk. So we're going to have some fun. My mission, whenever I speak, and I've only, I'm fairly new at this. I've only given 5,000 presentations. Uh, my goal is always to give you one idea. You know, when you think about what Mark Warren from MFS talked about yesterday about branding, and then David Sollers talked about stories, all of that blends right in with scripting and positioning yourself so that people can really refer you so easily. So I'll talk about that in just a little bit. So the so what referral formula. Who's ever heard of Mitch Santaga? Let me give you a little bit background. He was born in Canada in 1927. Family was from Italy, he was a plumber, loves jazz music, especially Frank Sinatra and Tony Bennett. His nephew worked on his fishing boat every summer, loved to hang out. So what Mitch would do is, he was a plumber in Canada, he would talk to the nightclub owners and say, my, my nephew loves to sing, could we exchange services? I'll do the plumbing if you let him get on stage and sing. So one night at, on stage, a friend of the Prime Minister hears him sing. He says, wow, this guy's fantastic. 
So he talks to the prime minister and says, I've got someone who, ne who you need to have at your daughter's wedding. This guy's a fantastic singer. So he shows up at the wedding, sings, just wows the audience, and there happens to be a major record producer there who ends up signing him on to a record label. So let me tell you who we're talking about. Anyone here Michael Bublé? He got a personal introduction. 25 million albums sold worldwide. Number one billboard, you can read it all. 65 million in revenues from concerts worldwide. So what he did, you see what happened with Mitch. He gave him a personal introduction. Not, oh gee, you should call this guy and see how he is, but he got a personal introduction. I've been in this business since 1987. And the big thing back then, when I would show up at our Merrill office in Boston or Ohio, when I covered Ohio, we would just, I'd bring in 25 pizzas, a bunch of sodas, and we would dial for dollars. And cold calls back then was really interesting because there wasn't caller ID. We didn't have iPhones and things like that. This is right, 1987, 1990. And, and the weird thing would happen, if you had a good script and you could pitch a fund or, or something that was you know, really hot, to, hot, hot going right now, people would actually pick up the phone and they would buy something over the phone. It was amazing to me that people would buy from complete strangers. Well, all that's changed now, right? Cold calling's not that easy. Direct mailing, advertising, public seminars was a big hit, and I did a lot of those in the 80s and the 90s. Now what's really worked out better is favorable introductions. So I'm gonna talk about that in a little bit. But how many have done seminars, client events? Oh, I have never seen that many hands go up. Public seminars or client events? That is fantastic, I applaud you. Gee. I'm, on, I'm not surprised that you're all here, that you're all successful. You're doing what most people won't do. But you get it, don't you? So, you know, I talked about um, trying to be the best. So two weeks ago at the Canadian Open, big golf tournament, Tim Clark won $1 million. Anyone see the tournament? Okay, the PJ started this morning, right? But this is the Canadian Open. So Tim Clark won a million bucks. Jim Furyk was one stroke behind and won $615,000. So in my presentations, I always ask you, can you get one stroke better? So think about the, the difference here. Furyk wins 600,000 versus a million. He's one stroke behind. So the tournament's of four days, right? How much better was Tim to win? How much better, on average? Four days, one stroke, quarter of a stroke. Fascinating. So when we share things like this, and I, again, I talked about Mark Warren and Dave and some of the other speakers, what can you take from that presentation that makes you just a little bit better, right? What makes you all a little bit better than, than the people who started several years ago, right? You're the cream of the crop. You're the best of the best because you do things and you do them right. So what can you do to get a little bit better, one stroke better? And by the way, third place was four strokes behind Tim Clark. Four strokes, and he won $300,000. Four strokes over four days. Right, fascinating. So we've done some research, and how many of you are on horse's mouth? You get horsesmouth.com. Jot this down. I see a few hands. Jot this down, please. I'm not, I don't work for them. I don't promote them. But it's a great site for financial advisors, horsesmouth.com. Uh, if you register, you get the, the first 30 days for free. Lots of articles on referrals and client events and how to be better than you know, most of them. Uh, 5% of advisors said they were satisfied with the referral strategy. This is a, a, some research they did. A full 80% said they had either no referral strategy at all, or they employ an unfocused or inconsistent strategy, and the same number expressed their desire to change. So let me just flash back 10 years ago. Horse's mouth again. I did some research with them. And they called 2,500 investors and asked them a very simple question. Would you give your advisor a referral? And 87% said, absolutely. So the question to them was, well, how many times does your advisor ask? 20% said, I get asked. 87% said, I would gladly give him a referral. So there's a real disconnect, and we're going to try to cover that this morning and try to get, get to the top of it and make it a little bit easier. So they didn't know the problem we found is they didn't know who to ask for referrals. They didn't know when to ask, and they didn't know how to ask. So everything I'm covering in this presentation is an experience I went through with Mark Bagnacca, the author of So What? I was wholesaling in New England back in, uh, the, back in the 90s, 
And uh, I said, Mark, I'm, I'm really trying to improve my business. And I loved cold calling. I love that, the game of converting someone who's never done business with us into a client. But I was working 70 hours a week. I worked weekends, I was sending out thank you notes, birthday cards, all those things. And Mark said, what are you trying to do here? And I said, I want to really build my business. I want to get up to a whole new level. I was number one in the country in sales, but we're always trying to get better, right? Do we ever become satisfied? No way, we're always trying to get better. And he, so he talked about referrals and he gave me the simplest explanation, the simplest role, the simplest model to do this. He said, stop what you're doing. It's crazy. He said, why don't you just meet with your top clients and ask them for referrals? Well, it, it may seem simple to you, but it was a real aha moment for me because I loved the cold calling. I loved the hunt. What happened over the next 12 months was fascinating. My business went through the roof. And the script I used, I went through my entire list. I looked at the top 20% of my clients. Most were Merrill Lynch, Merrill Boston, Merrill Providence, all, all over New England. And the script that Mark helped me with was this. Adam, you and I have done business a long time together. Who else do you know that I can help the way I've helped you with your business? That was it. Now, these people trusted me. They'd been doing business with me for years. They knew I was a good guy. They knew I was Mr. Win-Win, Mr. Value Added. And the referrals would just flow in. There was one guy in the Providence office who would say, hey, Neil, we just grabbed a couple guys from Smith Barney. We just brought them over. Come on over. I want to, give you, I want to introduce you personally. And he would rave about me. And it was great. And I thought, this is the easiest job in the world. Once I had a script and once I, once I tried it. So the problem is this. Many people say, well, I don't want to get rejected. You know, fear rejection. I, what if I ask and, and I really irritate Many of these presentations that you see during these training meetings are really trying to give you some more tools to be successful and find more assets, right? Sometimes you have to be creative on that. <clears throat> I just want to take a step back just for a second. Wasn't it fascinating to see, I mean, that video is from the 60s, the old cars before iPhones, before all these things. So when I did a little research on, on referrals and, uh, and on our business, I thought back to the 1940s. Do you know what the lifespan was? of tip of average person, life, what is the lifespan in the 1940s? 65, exactly right. So think back to your business. Right? I visit with, um, with Bob, 1945, I'm retired, ready to retire. I said, Bob, you've taken great care of me, thank you so much. And Bob says to me, you know, I'm 64 years old, right? Bob says, this money is gonna last you the rest of your life. Is he right? Yeah, because I'm gonna live in a year. Maybe two if I eat granola and practice yoga, right? Let's flash forward to today. What are some of the oldest clients you've heard of? What ages? 101, right? In the 90s, it's very, very common. So your role as financial advisors is so critical right now because people are retiring at 60, they're going on another 40 years. So when I think back to the story about the, the pilot, in a sense, aren't you taking people from where they are now to where they want to be in the future, right? And you're getting them ready for the longest vacation of their life, 30, 40 years. Just amazing how important your role is today. So my goal today is to give you some ideas on referrals and have you be the go-to person. So I'm, I'm sitting with my financial advisor 12 years ago. We go over all the finance stuff and he asked me a very simple question. He said, you and Christine are gonna be buying a house. You're getting a new house in, in, uh, in a couple months. Do you have a mortgage person, someone you really trust. I said, well, no, I just go to the bank. I don't really know anybody. He said, oh, hold on. Let me give you John's name. I'll call John and tell him you're gonna give him a call. This guy's fantastic. I've known him for 10 years. He's my go-to person. And uh, he, I also mentioned I was buying a new car. I was getting a new Mercedes. And he said, well, do you have a guy you, do you talk to about, you know, where are you gonna buy the car? And he said, I'll give you the guy. This, this is a perfect guy. I bought several Mercedes from over the last years, the last several years. He's reliable. He's honest. He'll give you a great deal. And I know you can count on him. So what, this, what Tim did is he became my go-to person for everything. Everything financial. Kids' education, right? Estate planning. All those things, which you all do, right? And it just made me think that he now became, well, I couldn't replace him because I, I count on him so much. And so when we talk about referrals, my goal is to get you even more to a point where when someone talks about you, when a client talks about you to a neighbor, 
they call you their go-to person. You cover everything. You're Mr. or Miss Reliable, right? Everything they need, you're the person for it. So again, if they're gonna live another 30, 40 years, I want you to have the whole enchilada. I want you to have everything. Does that make sense? Okay. So we have a secret formula, and I'll give this to you in just a little bit. Who, when, and what? Here's the goal. More money by working with clients who have more assets. As Al said, so what? We all know that, right? More time by working smarter rather than working harder. In 2005, I wrote a book. I'm rewriting it now, and it was the magic of working smarter. Because everything I learned from Mark on how to not to work hard anymore, but to work smart, and to get referrals, and, and to become uh, the go-to person, just changed my life. I didn't have to work as much, but I was much more productive. I was making a lot more money, and uh, I'm rewriting the book. I'm gonna release it in about two months, and it's free to all, all the Merrill advisors. All right, it'll be a freebie, it'll be a download. And by doing that, you end up having more fun by working with people who really appreciate you. That's the bottom line, right? This, this business can be so much fun if you're calling on clients you really enjoy working with. So here's the process. Here's what Mark taught me to do, and I talked about this earlier. He said, go through your book of business. Who do you have a great relationship with? And I could think of uh, you know, Steve Palmashano in Providence and some Doug Dubiel in Boston and all these other branches where I had really great relationships. He said, here's a simple question. Sit with them and ask them, can you think of three or four other people in this region who I can help, as I said earlier, the way I've helped you with business? And they'd say, sure. And they start jotting names down. It was so easy. So here's what I ask you to do. And we can get these brochures to you, but I think you could do this on a, on a napkin, really. Think of your best relationships. And who could give you referrals? Maybe centers of influence, maybe, right? Maybe their CPA, maybe their attorney, whoever it is. And you don't need to ask all of your clients. You know, somebody said, well, Neil, I have 500 clients. Who do I ask? Narrow it down to the best relationships. And if you do that, it's very, very simple, right? And then you can work with them. So when I, when I talked to Mark about the ideal client profile, before I did this, he said, describe your clients. And I said, well, most came from, uh, you know, the, the cold calling nights I did or some of the seminars I did. And he said, let's go through everything, age, family, income, source of client, what they value, and their career. We went through everything, and it was a real aha moment for me. Then I knew exactly who my target market was. My target market tended to be the, the, the people who had been doing business for a while. Perhaps they were in the military like I was. I was in the Air Force in the 70s. They were athletes. I was a professional athlete in the, uh, in the 80s and the 90s. But there were people who had drive. There were people who had passion. Now, I've only been speaking here for 35 minutes. Do you think pessimists like to be around me? No. It's just too much, but I love what I do. I'm passionate about what I do, just like you are. All right? So what I tended to find when I analyzed all my clients is they tended to be like me. Right? People tend to do business with people they like and people they have something in common with. Right? So I just want to take a step back. Many of you raised your hands for the client events. Could, somebody, could we have a microphone back there, please? I want to hear some of the examples of what you've done and, uh, and how well it worked out. Could I have a volunteer, please? Who's done the client events? Perfect. All the way up here, please. Sorry to make you walk all the way up. But he's pretty enthusiastic about this. Is it Casey? Corner? OK, thank you. Tell us about your example. Would you mind standing up, please? Thank you. Um, I've done a couple, well actually I built my entire practice off of workshops, seminars, whatever you want to call them. I've done social security, I've done estate planning, primarily social security. Um, that's how we've done it. I mean, how many people? Uh, it, typically a perfect number for us is 15 to 20. We've had, a, we've had over 80 people attend a workshop, mm -hmm. which sounds great, but it's terrible, too many people. It is, yeah. 20 to 50 is ideal, Direct what's that? Mail. He asked how we advertise, uh, we do direct mail with, I mean, the whole point is to screen effectively. If you don't have good data, garbage in, garbage out, but if you have uh, screening, no, we, do, we actually go and get lists and then direct mail out to that. We don't call, we just direct mail. Oh, yeah, simple. We, we usually have our assistant or one of us takes the call and tries to glean at least a little bit of information, basics, you know, when, 
are they planning on retiring, what they're interested in, what they're hoping to get out of it, confirm their name and address so that we can pull them off our list and make sure that our data is valid. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Round of applause, please. <clears throat> One more client event. So there was a handsome, there you go. Thank you. Love that you all volunteer. This is great. This is, this is brainstorming. This is how we learn, right, from the best. It's, it's sharing success stories because there's plenty of assets to go around. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Scott from Sparta, New Jersey, and um, we hosted this past May a Mother's Day event. <sighs> we invited um, affluent female clients. They didn't have to be mothers. It was an appreciation of all women and mothers. Uh, we had uh, about 40 people, and the rule was bring somebody we don't know. And we got about five clients out of it. Isn't that great? Thank you so much. Round of applause. He asked me what we did for the event. We had a lady come in from Mainstay uh, Mutual Funds that did a program uh, all about uh, what women need to do to secure their financial information. And she gave away a safe. A safe. That's cool. I'm going to talk more about client events. Thank you for that. I re really appreciate it. I'm going to talk more about client events. It is the easiest way I have found to get referrals. And I've spoken at over 250 events over the years. Real easy. I'll talk about that in a little bit. So do the I ideal, uh, the client profile. I do this at every Merrill Lynch office in New England. And I learned how to work smarter, like I said. And it was just fascinating to me. I thought, why have I been working so darn hard trying to convert people to become clients when all I had to do is look at my client base? And they were raving fans of mine because I kept in touch and I always added value whenever I walked in the, in the office. My license plate was win-win because my attitude was if I can help you build your business and an opportunity comes in where you could give some business back to me, will it happen? Yeah, if, if I have funds that perform, right? It's the law of reciprocity. Well, the same thing goes with your clients. If you help them reach their goals, whether it's you know, planning for retirement, a college funding, a mortgage, or anything else you do, they're going to speak pretty highly of you, right? So it really does create that law of reciprocity. But all we have to do is ask. We just have to know how to ask. So the ideal may be one of your smaller clients. I, I think of this guy, Tom, in Waltham, Mass. Uh, he didn't do mutual funds, and I was a mutual fund wholesaler. He did annuities, so I really couldn't help him. But he was a raving fan, and he was a center of influence. People just love this guy. All walked in, you know, he's always had a bow tie on, and always looked sharp. And um, whenever I came into the office, he'd say, Neil, I've got to introduce you to, 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 to some new guys we just brought in. So he was a great center of influence. And I had excellent chemistry and rapport with the people I worked in, worked with, and they trusted me, they believed in me, and they did all they could, all they could to help me build a business. So let me just go and do something here during coffee casual. I found that if I worked with these people individually, one-to-one, -one, for a cup of coffee, or taking them out to dinner, or things like that, it was much easier to have that, that conversation about what they're doing, what their needs are. And what I found fascinating is when I would sit with an advisor and I'd say, tell me about your business. Take five minutes, tell me about your business. What are you doing? What are the challenges? You know, who are you, what's your target market? And I would take notes. Advisors would, be, would look at me shocked. You're gonna listen? I said, yeah. Right, we talk about consultative selling. How, you've had training on that, right? Asking questions and then doing what? Listening, right? We tend to speak 85% of the time. And of course, I'm up here, I speak 100% of the time, right? But if you get more involved with consultative selling, asking the right questions and then listening, it opens up a whole plethora of opportunities for you to be really more, more of a, an advisor for these folks. So I did the same thing. I'm not telling you anything new. So here's a script. And again, we talked about this a little bit easier. You've got to have a script that makes sense to you. And you've got to make a, have a script that you can just read and say so easily. So I talk about scripting a lot. How many have been asked, what do you do? Pretty common question, right? All right. So when you get a copy of So What, what are you going to find? I want you to look on page 92. There's a guy named Frank in Providence. And Frank had just arrived at his favorite golf course and was introduced to the other two members of his foursome, both business owners. Before they teed off, one of the business owners asked Frank, so what do you do? Without missing a beat and appearing spontaneous, Frank said, do you know how most business owners have a CFO to help them manage your company's money? Make sense? 
Yes, right? He said, the business owner said, well, of course. He said, well, what I do is work as a personal CFO for my clients to help them make work optional. And the, the golfer asked him, well, how do you do that? And he said, let's play golf first, and then I'll, we can talk about it over lunch. And when he explained what he did over lunch, he picked up two new business clients. So now, who's listening to Paul Harvey on the radio? He, he shares a story, right? And then there's a little break, and then he says, so now, for the rest of the story, right? Let me tell you the rest of the story. Frank is with MetLife, has been with MetLife, million dollar round table for 25 years, very, very successful. If the business owner asked him what he did, and he said, oh, hi, I'm with MetLife, what is likely to happen? Oh, God. 18 holes of why I need life insurance, right? And, and I, I can, I'm sure if I were there, if, if I were the other golfer, I'd, I'd say to myself, oh, geez, I'd, Frank, you know what? I'd love to play. I have to go get a root canal. So, uh, you know, I wish you all the best. But Frank had a script, and he captured his attention, right? So, you know, we think of, there's another example we use, and it's in the book, about um, a business meeting we were in. And again, this ties into referrals and scripting. We're at this business meeting in Boston, and we asked each business owner to stand up, introduce themselves, and tell us what they do. So this applies to you also. So Barbara stood up. She said, hi, I'm with Coldwell Banker. I've been selling homes for 20 years, offices on Main Street. If I can help you, let me know. So one by one, they got up. And then Floyd stood up, and he said, good morning. I'm Floyd, and I'm an automotive consultant. And he sat down. Ladies and gentlemen, what is an automotive consultant? Mechanic, car salesman, right? Who knows? I mean, I, I think back to when I was a kid, we had garbage men pick up the garbage. What are they called now? Sanitary engineers. Wow, right? So I, I looked around the audience, and people were like, automotive consultant. So I said, Floyd, do you mind standing up again and tell us what you do? He said, absolutely. He said, do you know how most people don't like the process of buying a new car because they don't like dealing with a salesperson? I'm going to agree with that. Right? Most of us, and we're in sales. He said, well, what I do is for $295, I take my clients through a 15-point process. I help them determine the exact right car that they need and that they want. And then I go to the dealership with them, and I negotiate the best price. Very different from automotive consultant. He explained what he did. So now you've never heard that. How much did he charge his clients? 295, how many points in the process? 15. What, after he helped you figure out the car, what would he do? He'd help you negotiate the best price. That's why when somebody asks you, what do you do, you don't simply want to say, I'm a financial advisor. You've got to have a script, but you've got to have something that makes sense. So when I, I gave this presentation in Scottsdale, a woman raised her hand in the back of the room, there were 350 advisors. She said, I could never say that I'm a personal CFO. I'm not saying you have to. What I'm saying is you find something that captivates their attention. I know pilots who say, who become advisors who say, I act as a pilot for my clients. I take them from where they are now to where they want to be in the future. And even though the air might get a little rocky, I'm right here. I've been doing this a long time. That's a good script. Does that make sense? So here's the downside for this. Not scripting. But when you only say you're a financial advisor, I've been in the business since uh, 1987. I know what you do. I know the level of integrity at Merrill Lynch. You've always been my number one client when I was in sales, when I was wholesaling. You get it. You're well-trained. You cream the crop, right? But if you say to somebody that you're a financial advisor or a financial planner, and they think back to the 80s and the 90s when cold calls were, were rampant, and they're thinking, oh, a stock jockey. Are you stock jockeys? Not at all. But people, not everybody knows exactly what you do. So have a good script that really captivates their attention. Uh, if some of you want some examples, we have, and this is from the So What presentation, we have 10 of the best scripts, or 10 most popular ones that advisors are using nationwide. If you want a copy of it, uh, check with Anna, and I'll get it out to you. I'll get it to Anna, and we'll get that. So the 10 best scripts for financial advisors. How are we doing so far? Good. How many of you have one idea so far? Worth your time? Should I leave? No, there's more. So anyway, get a good script. Script should be specific to your client. Do you know other executives at your firm who may need retirement planning like I've done for you? 
Have the script. Know what you want to say. Long-term care of college. Remember the conversation I had with my advisor? He covered all these things. I know the, uh, there was a focus. I was in Bethesda at your rollout meeting two weeks ago. And uh, there's a big push on the, on the seven life principles, the, the you know, holistic planning. Huge. You become irreplaceable to your clients. So we'll talk more in a little bit. Here's a weak script. Hey, do you know anyone else looking for a financial advisor? That's weak. That's just terrible. All right? Use script exactly what you want to say. Rehearse it often so it just flows. And uh, the one I've helped is, and I've shared this many times, is do you know anyone else I can help the way I've helped you? Simple enough. But again, I'd be specific with retirement planning, with college funding, with anything like that. You want to become the go-to person. Use stories to make your point. David Sollers talked about this yesterday. People remember stories. So I'll share one with you that an advisor shared with me last week. He said, Neil, I had this client who was mega rich. Compound up at Lake Winnipesaukee, up in New Hampshire. Spectacular home in the Boston area. Mercedes, Jaguars, convertibles. This guy was loaded. Kids all went to private schools and on to private college. He was so wealthy. And I did his retirement planning. He said, then all of a sudden, at 56 years old, this guy dies of a heart attack. 56, 57 years old. He said, what I failed to do is get involved with him for estate planning and life insurance. The family lost everything. There was nobody to run his business now. There was no life insurance in place. He said, all these years I've known this guy, and I could have done something so simple, but I never felt he needed it, so I never asked. The family lost everything. The family was destitute. They lost the homes, the cars, everything. Kids had to, had to go to a different college instead. So it's important to, with this holistic planning is, is to ask questions. You know, what are you doing for life insurance? What are you doing for estate planning? Simple questions where you just sit and chat with somebody. Does that make sense? I felt so badly when he told me this story. He was, he was crushed because he, he was so close with this guy. So we'll get this to you about the, uh, you know, the top five referral clients. I'll get the paperwork to you. I didn't want to bombard you with paperwork this morning. So review your ideal client profile. Identify the top five clients, as I talked about. Customize your scripts. And then commit to refresh this every 90 days. But again, you can find horse's mouth as a great resource. You've got to be referable. So we always keep our promises. We do what we're going to say. And we strengthen the relationships. So when I, when I worked with Mark Magnac again in the, in the 90s, what I realized is I had a book of business that was a mile wide, but relationships that were an inch deep. I knew very little about my clients. So I started digging. I started asking more questions and just, just listening and paying attention. And all of a sudden, my relationships got a mile deep, and I narrowed my book of business. I didn't want to do business with everybody. I had over 1,000 people doing business. I tried to keep track of everybody. It was crazy. I mean, you know, we didn't have the technology that we have today. But I like to treat my clients like I treat my friends. They know I care. They know I have their best interests at heart. They know I'm going to do all I can to help them succeed. And that makes a difference. Showing appreciation for referrals. I talked about this earlier. So I've spoken over 250 client events. So I want to share some examples. Now, I agree with what you said. 20 to 50 is a great size. I walked into one firm asked me to just consult. They said, come to our annual client event. We just want you to watch and get an idea of what's going on. 650 people in a grand ballroom. Open bar, buffet, and people just ate and drank for two hours. And then at 9 o'clock at night, they had a portfolio manager come up and talk about beta coefficients and how he picks stocks. What do you think it looked like 20 minutes in that presentation? Yeah, exactly right. People were nodding off. It was terrible. So too big. It's insane to try to manage. But... Some of the examples we've had, we had, there was an advisor I worked with in Boston who said, I'm going to have a client event. I want to have a total of 50 people, max. And he said, what I've done, because we scripted him on this, he said, I, I'm going to call my clients and uh, say, Bob, we're having a client event like we had last quarter. Uh, if you'd like to join us, we'd love to have you. It's on this date. And this was a phone call, by the way, to a client, not the mailings. I, like, I prefer the phone calls. It's another touch. So says, Bob, we have an event at Capitol Grill, private room. Uh, if you'd like to bring another friend, feel welcome to do that. Not obligated at all, 
but uh, some people like to bring a friend to it so they have someone to sit with. But if you are going to bring somebody, let us know so we have enough room. Does that make sense? Okay. I heard one, one script from another, one of your competitors, and they would call their clients and say, we're having a client event. If you'd like to join us, you have to bring two other couples. Now, if I'm your client and you tell me I have to bring two other couples, it's like two words for you, bye-bye. I have no interest. But to welcome them to bring somebody. So we're at this client event, and at the end of the event, Shep gets up and he says, folks, I want to thank you all for joining us for dinner tonight. And since you're all business owners, I want to introduce some some of the folks I do business with. So he took one person from each table and he introduced them. He said, Barbara runs a florist shop. It's over on North Main Street. Does a fantastic job. All the flowers on the tables tonight are from Barbara. So if you have a special occasion coming up and you need something, give her a call. She's wonderful to work with. The next person owned a muffler shop. The next one owned a car dealership. The next one was um, Dr. Johnson, uh, a taxidermist. Where do you bring your pets when they're ill? A veterinarian, not a taxidermist, pardon me. No, no, sorry. So, a veterinarian. So he went right down the row and he introduced all these people. At the back of the room happened to be the restaurant owners, and they were having a tough time with, with the person who was providing flowers. They gave Barbara a contract for two years that night. So while we like to ask for referrals, what did he do? He gave them, right? He gave them and he helped them build their business. We had another, uh, there was a guy named Jay who had this event and at the end of the night he said, folks, I want to thank all of you for your referrals. This has been my best year ever and I like holding these events every quarter. And tonight I have this beautiful gift basket. Now compliance, it has to be under $100, right? And he, in this gift basket, a variety of things and books and cheese and wine and all these things. And he said, I want to give this to my top referral person for the quarter. What is your name? Tony. So he walked over, let's pretend, right? Gave this beautiful, beautiful gift basket to Tony. Tony had given this, this advisor six referrals. Just a raving, raving fan. He was also worth eight and a half million dollars. Did he need a gift basket worth a hundred bucks? Not at all. But he was so touched to get that public praise in front of everybody. He called Jay the next morning and he said, there was a class act. I really appreciate what you did. Grab your pen. I have five more names for you. So to mention that during a client event, I'm a competitive guy. If I see you get a gift basket, Tony, what am I thinking? Oh, I want that next time. How do I get that? And then, so it sends a message out, hey, we love referrals. We're in the business of helping people get from where they are now to where they want to be over the next 30 years. We want to help you. It just sends a very simple message out, and we have a lot of fun with it. Does that make sense? Any other success stories from the client events? These are so easy. Uh, we used to do the public seminars. Um, they still work, right? Social Security and things like that. But think about your client base and the folks who live close by. Yes, sir. Uh, I had a client lunch where I invited clients in the similar field, uh, real estate, just to introduce them to each other. Uh. And that worked out really well, just bringing people together. One of the people who I never met, was a friend of my client, came and asked, when are you doing this again? So th that's worked out really well. Isn't that just, great? How many were there? Uh, did five guests myself, six people total. That's fantastic. You know, it's little things like that that go a long way. So be creative. You know, think of the $10 bill under the tire. Be creative. And, and then you become more of a part of that community, right? So uh, I have found, and I don't know if this is still okay, you can tell me, when it came to financing these seminars, these events, you can't call them client appreciation events, you can call them client event. Find the wholesalers who you really believe in and who, who you've really partnered with to pony up a little bit of money, all right? It does, they're not expensive. Uh, one of the advisors, well, several advisors I know will call a client and say, I know you have a birthday coming up in two weeks. Big birthday for you, congratulations. I wanna take you and a few friends to breakfast. My treat, very inexpensive. You don't talk business, right? But you may pick up a few referrals and even if that client can't make it, you touch them again with a phone call and you made them feel special. There's very, very simple things. Okay, jot this down, please. This is one of the best books I have ever read in my life in this business. Story Selling for Financial Advisors by Scott West and Mitch Anthony. Now, most of you will remember the Floyd, the con right? Floyd, the automotive consultant story. Many of you remember the airplane story. People remember stories. 
Maybe you might remember the advisor who never talked to his client about estate planning and life insurance and things like that. This is a great book. It's been up about maybe 12, 12 years or so. It's thick. It has lots of stories. And it just makes things easier if we're going to talk about asset allocation. So one of the stories I've used when I'm talking to a client about asset allocation, when I speak at a client event, I'd hold up an SUV. Number one selling car, type of car in America. So here's how I explained asset allocation. I'd ask folks, how many of you own an SUV? All wheel drive, people would raise their hands. I'd say, do you know why this is so popular? Because if one wheel gets stuck in the muck, right, or the snow or the ice, I live in New England, lots of snow, right, lots of mud sometimes, the other three wheels are designed to pull that car out and to move forward. Isn't that like asset allocation, diversification? We don't know what's going to be hot. Small caps, large caps, international, bonds, we don't know. But by using asset allocation and using the, I actually had a, I brought in an SUV, a, a Humvee, a small one, not a big one. And people would get it. It made sense. Uh, your clients for life. We talk, we'll talk about this in a little bit. I know we're going to take a break in nine minutes. And when we come back, we'll talk about the life planning process. But Your Clients for Life was written by Mitch Anthony. Great book. And ideally, that's what I want to get for you. I want your clients to be with you forever. And the, the beauty of the client events, for example, and getting referrals is if you help them with all of their needs, then you start talking about multi-generational marketing. Then you, become, you get to know their kids and their grandkids. right? And then you, you find you get a lot more referrals. So. Know your client's fears, concerns. We'll talk about this in a little bit. Know what keeps them awake at night. That's one of the biggest complaints we've seen when, when research has been done. My advisor doesn't really understand what keeps me awake at night. They don't know why I toss and turn. I'm afraid of outliving my assets, right? Big concern. In 1964, when I worked with Bob, I was only going to live a year. I didn't care. These days, I absolutely care. So we'll talk about this in a little bit. Can we show the uh, next video, please? The gentleman in the elevator now is a candid star. These folks who are entering, the man with the white shirt, the lady with the trench coat, and subsequently one other member of our staff will face the rear. And you'll see how this man in the trench coat <laughs> tries to maintain his individuality but little by little, <laughs> he looks at his watch, but he's really making an excuse for turning just a little bit more <laughs> to the wall. Now we'll try it once again. Here's the candid subject. Here comes the candid camera staff, three of them at least. And uh, this man has apparently been in groups before. with his hat on in the elevator. First he makes a full turn to the rear and Charlie closes the door. A moment later, we'll open the door. Everybody's changed positions. <laughs> now we'll see if we can use group pressure for some good. Now, in a moment, on Charlie's signal, everybody turns forward. Notice, they take off their hats. And now, do you think we could reverse the procedure? Watch. Here's why I share this. We have five more minutes. I share that video because when people aren't sure what to do, what do they do? They do what everybody else is doing, right? You're not like that. That's one reason you're all here. You're going above and beyond what the average advisor does, right? You, you know how to build your book of business. You know how to get referrals and do all this thing. So uh, hopefully, I gave you a couple ideas that'll, that'll take you to, to another level and help you reach some of your goals. We have four minutes. 
I'm gonna open up for Q&A. You're gonna take a 15 minute break and then come back here for about another 20 minutes, okay? So what questions do you have on what I talked about, whether it's referrals or client events or anything like that? Questions? Yes, sir. Well, there's a mic coming over your way. I can, I can project, okay, good. easy to them. Uh, how can we kind of be positive and encourage that? I, I couldn't hear the um, question. Sorry. Okay. With some people, it's not as easy for them to volunteer names, per se? Yes. Um, how can we encourage that? How can, in other words, how can we be positive without forcing some people where it, it may not necessarily come naturally? Right. Some people are introverted. Some people have had poor experiences with referrals in the past, and they don't want their reputation sullied again. Absolutely. Uh, I've got my own story with that, but that's another matter. I, I and, agree. You know, could you, could you speak to that a little bit for us? Yes. There, there will be some people who just say, you know what, I, I can't think of anybody. And that doesn't mean never. It just means perhaps for now or at, to your point. They may, have been, they may have given a referral before, and I've done it, you know, and I get burned because things didn't work out the way I, I had hoped. Um, not everybody's going to say yes, but that's part of it, isn't it? It's, it's part of, it's like asking someone to, uh, if they want to work with you. Some will say no. It doesn't mean never. It might, but, but it means just not right now. So, so you just don't ask them again. You know, maybe you circle back in six months. Say, hey, by the way, do you know anybody else I can help? Like uh, the script I shared with you. We've done a lot of work with your estate plan. Anybody else you can think of in your neighborhood or at work that I can help the way I've helped you? And then if they say no again, I would just, I'd just take them off the list because there's a lot of other people to ask. Okay? I think he's saying they have somebody in mind, but they don't want to divulge their information or give out their phone number just yet. Okay. So what, one of the things that I would do with that is you invite them to a breakfast or a lunch or to go golfing. Uh, some of the client events we've held is uh, for the clients who play golf, a short game clinic. And you say, you're welcome to bring your friend. And then, then, then that friend that they don't really want to divulge the information on gets to see you in action. They see you, you're a good person. Do you have a good attitude? Do you seem competent? Is this someone I really want to work with? In some of the client events, we've had people bring a guest many times. And I can think of this one time in particular. The, uh, the guest looked around and he said, oh my gosh, I know you, I know you, I know you. He said, my advisor never does this for me. I've been with them 10 years. And he switched advisors. He switched it to the, guy, the person who was holding this, this client event. So it takes time to warm up for, you know, the, for people to say yes to referral, but there are ways around that, and that's inviting to the client events and getting, letting them get to know you as a person. Does that make sense? Yes. So, so we've done the short game clinic and tennis clinics and things like that. Yes. Our roughest issue has been following up with them afterwards because you don't want to seem too salesman-y. Right. And, you know, kind of piss off your client who brought the friend, but you want to get in touch with the guest. Set expectations. Set expectations. Yeah. What have you done to follow up? We don't have a real formal kind of way of following up. You follow up with your client? Yeah. Okay. But we've had some where it said, you know, they loved it and, you know, but that's, it kind of stops there. We don't say, you know have you spoken to it, you know, so mm -hmm. we just don't want to make it awkward for our client. Because no, I agree with, yeah, yeah, you don't want to make them uncomfortable. So you have another event and this person gets to see you again and again and they get more comfortable. It takes a little time. You know, you, you got to think back in, uh, in 19, we have 30 seconds and we'll come back after the 15 minute break. In 1999, there were 250 funds that averaged over 100% for one year. It was insane. And then a lot of people got hurt when the, when the technology boom imploded and those funds just got devastated. So a lot of people are tentative. They lost a lot of money. They want to be sure you're true. They want to get to know you better because this is a relationship business. It's not about commodities and...